Before we go into today's satsang, let us all chant three Om Kars. Om. 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 My humble pranam at the divine lotus feet of our beloved Bhagavan, Sri Satya Sai Baba. Very happy to invite you all to today's satsang with Brother Tribhuvan Sachdeva. A few words about our distinguished speaker, Brother Tribhuvan Sachdeva. Before we go into his introduction, we would like to first touch upon his family. His family is an example of utmost devotion and dedication to the divine principles of Sri Satya Sai Baba. Mr. Uh, Tribhuvan hails from a family that totally involved in Sai mission. He came into Swami's fold when he was 12 years old. His father, S.K. Sachdeva, was a state president of Madhya Pradesh for 25 long years from 1985 to 2010. His mother was a Balvikas guru and a state spiritual coordinator. His wife is the head of Balvikas and youth division of Sri Satisai organization Madhya Pradesh. His sister, a member of Balvikas and youth activities in Hong Kong. She has also studied in Sri Satisai College in Bhopal. His younger brother belongs to the first batch of MBA and, uh, and was a student in Swami's Institute for about nine years. His elder son has completed MBA in Swami's Institute at Prashanti Nilayam. About Brother Dribhuvan, his education, he studied in Swami's Institute, Prashanti Nilayam between 1979 to 85, did his graduation and post-graduation in commerce. He holds a degree of MCOM LLB and he is a leading income tax lawyer in Madhya Pradesh. As a student, he had the good fortune of taking part in lead roles like Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and Surdas in place directly directed by Bhagwan. He has delivered lectures in various occasions before Bhagwan in Prashanti Nilayam during student days. With special directions from Swami, he served as a lecturer of commerce in the Institute of Prashanti Nilayam for two years between 1985 and 87. Bro Brother Tribhuvan was very fortunate to have had innumerable interviews with Bhagwan. He was a regular Prashanti Mandir Bhajan singer and sang in various occasions before Bhagwan. He was also the district president of Indore for six years between 2006 and 2012. He was a visiting faculty of IAM Indore and other local colleges. He has addressed students of public of MP in 10 day summer course on Indian culture and spirituality for 25 years. He has also narrated the story of life and teachings of Bhagavan through Sai Katha for around eight years during Swami's birthday celebrations. He is a diploma holder on Sri Satya Sai Educare from the Institute of Sri Satya Sai Education. Presently, he is a member of Sri Satya Sai Trust Madhya Pradesh and secretary of the National Council of 100 Satya Sai Schools in India and Secretary of Satya Sai Blood Bank at Indore and he is the Executive Editor of Sanatan Sarathi in Hindi. He is a faculty member of Institute of Satya Sai Education in India and he is frequently invited to address students and members of Sri Satya Sai organization at Prashant In Ilyam. With that introduction, I hope our audience today have gained 
an insight into his life and works of Sri Tribhuvan. Let me now invite Sai brother Tribhuvan to talk directly to you and share his memorable experiences. Over to Tribhuvan Sachdeva. Sai Ram. Sai Ram. <coughs> Om Shri Sai Ram, offering my most prayerful salutations at the lotus feet of our most beloved Lord, Bhagwan Baba. My dear brothers and sisters, elders, and all the loving devotees, a very warm and a loving Sai Ram to all of you. It is indeed an honor for me that this evening, I have been chosen by Bhagwan to have a satsang with his most favorite devotees in Chennai. And lucky for me, Brother Suresh, who was coordinating, asked me to speak on a subject which is closest to my heart, which is journey with Sri Satisai, our Lord and Master. If you look at it in a philosophical sense of the term, all of us are travelers onto this path of truth. All of us are trying to find our identities. All of us are always forever trying to find that hidden spark of divinity and keep it ignited in all of us. So too, this time I was lucky to be born in a very devout family at Indore. And as I grew up, my parents, who became devotees of Bhagwan, devotion and commitment towards Swami came naturally to me. I was barely 12 years of age when I first had Swami's darshans in White Fields. That was 1st of January 1972. And soon after that, my father was made the Samiti convener in Indore and then started a journey which with Bhagwan's grace is continuing till day. I had the opportunity of being in the first batch of Balavikas of Indore Samiti and uh, my teacher was Srimati Yashoda Bhatt who was the daughter of my erstwhile to be Vice Chancellor Sri VK Gokak and she was the one who gave us all the finer aspects of devotion and spirituality in this class of Balavikas. When I was in my teens, it was my father and mother's desire that I joined Swami's college in Brindavan. With all humility, I must say, I was very stupid then. I was not keen to go and join Swami's college. And what, what is the reason for that? Because I had learned that the students who go to Brindavan College have to wear white clothes, no movies, no motorbikes, no friends, nothing. You have to be good, you have to sing bhajans and you have to be constantly in the company and the watchful eye of the wardens there. So who wants to be in this age when you are growing up to be in a company like this? Because in our little sense of understanding, we thought that spirituality and bhajans are probably the last part of your age. That when you are into the sannyas ashram or the vanyaprastha ashram, that you should do bhajans and take God's name and do things like those. So we thought probably it is not the right time. But then fortunately for me, my father spoke to me regularly for, an, for a year. And then he motivated me and then ensured that I would attempt a, a serious go at the admissions when, when the examination or the interviews would be conducted. My mother would write a letter every day to Swami, praying to him that he accepts me and my younger brother as students in his college. Just before we left for uh, admission process in June 1979, my mother called the two of us, me and my brother, and requested that why don't both of you also write a letter to Swami? I have been writing for almost a year. High time when both of you want to write a letter, why don't you both write also? So we both wrote a letter 
and I was the more pragmatic and a practical guy. So I wrote a letter, put it in an envelope, wrote Bhagwan's name to Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba, Post Office Prashanti Nilayam, District Anandpur, Andhra Pradesh, pin code 515134. And I promptly went and posted that letter in the post box. You know, those red colored post boxes used to be there about 40 years ago. And uh, came back. And uh, my mother asked us, did you both write your letters? So both of us shook our heads. So my mother said, what did you do with your letter? So I promptly said, I posted it in the mailbox. And my mother asked my younger brother, and what did you do, my, my dear? My younger brother, let me tell you, he's a very holy and a very, very deeply spiritual soul. I remember when he was born, he was very young, hardly six months of age. And my mother's family back in Amritsar, in Punjab, they had a family guru then. And they used to call him by name Babaji. He had some spiritual uh, siddhis, you could say that. So the moment he was placed on his feet, so the first sentence he occurred, looking at my younger brother was, where did you catch hold of this fakir? That means he had that... Uh, he had that uh, soundings of a fakir even when he was six months old and he continued being like that and he still is a free bird, a wonderful devotee, a great soul whom Swami used to love abundantly. So when my mother asked him, what did you do with the letter? So he promptly replied saying that I have placed that letter behind Swami's picture. And now, as things would have it, it is nobody's guess whose letter would have reached first to Swami. I did the practical way. So my letter would have taken five days to reach. But when he placed it behind Swami's picture with that supreme confidence that it would reach Swami immediately. And between the two of us, I always considered myself to be the smarter one because he was a fakir, you know. So I always considered myself to be the smarter one because I was better in games, better in studies, better in all-round performance. He was an average uh, child, so as to say. When he would score 50% marks or passing marks, so as to speak, he, there would be celebrations in the family that, oh, at least he has passed and he has not flunked. And for me, though I was a little talented, if uh, Bhagwan would permit me to say that, but I never worked very hard. My only aim and objective used to be to get about 60-61% so that nobody says that you are a duffer. You could at least be ranked that you are a first division holder. So I never used to work hard, but with Swami's grace somehow, I used to get a first division. So when we both went, I was full, full of confidence that I'm going to walk into the college in the admissions during the interview and my brother may or may not get because he had low marks. When we went there, lo and behold, they sought an interview. And uh, they declared that my younger brother was selected, whereas I was not selected on technical grounds. And what are the technical grounds? That my brother had done 10 plus 2. He had done his 10th class from CBST. So he was eligible to join in the class 11 there. Since I had already done my 10 plus 1 plus 3 I was to get into. So they said, no, no, you ought to have done 10 plus 2. So you are also eligible for class 11 again. That means I would have to go down two years behind and what was most humiliating to be with my younger brother in the same class. So I refused. I said, no, I'm not going to seek admission. I'm not going to sit with my younger brother in class 11. I'm eligible for class. I'm eligible for degree first year. So confusion was galore in the family what to do. So we decided that while we were in Bangalore, let's go down and meet Professor Kasturi who was a family friend, Swami had sent him to Indore on a couple of occasions and he had come and stayed in our house. So father was very well known to him. So there was a place called Adu Godi in Bangalore where we decided to go and pay our respects to him. So he was sitting on a chair and we were all sitting on the floor and talking to him. <clears throat> so then my father told that, sir, we have a predicament here in the family. My younger son has been admitted into the uh, Bangalore college. But somehow, my, because of some technical grounds, my elder son has not been granted admissions. So what do you recommend? What should we do? So I still remember what Professor Kasturi told way back in June 1979. He said, he looked at me and he said, Tribhuvan, 
if bhagwan was to give me admission in 11th class even in this ripe old age i would gladly join so why don't you join that would mean two more years with bhagwan that would mean you have so much more time with swami but then probably i realized my ego came and uh, i said no no i cannot study with my own younger brother it would look humiliating for me i would rather try elsewhere so crest fallen we went back to vrindavan campus where the principal informed us that uh, since ribuvan is not keen to join in class 11 he could try his luck in puttaparthi where a new college was coming up this year and maybe if he's lucky enough he could get admission there so my younger brother who had placed the letter behind swami's picture promptly got this admission without any hitch without any problems and i the egoistic one the smarter one thought no ends of myself and i thought i would just walk in was made to walk right up to puttaparthi without an admission and even when i went to puttaparthi i realized that there was no college there was no hostel building they were all under construction yet after staying 10 or 12 days with great difficulty we found out some affiliation uh, problems were not there so i may get admission so after the guru purnima in july first week my parents left me in puttaparthi to fend for myself and they left for indore now those 15 20 days when i had to stay all by myself in the ganesh shed near the main entrance as you would enter then there was a ganesh shed because there was a lord ganesh statue placed there so the hall which was placed there was known as ganesh shed so i stayed there in the 15 or 20 days in that shed and those were some of the most learning days for me i met other students aspiring students there i found out they were they were all from different backgrounds probably and uh, everyone was keen to join the competition was tough and suddenly i found myself praying to swami to get me admission to get me admitted into his college and as luck would have it though i had to wait for almost 3 weeks after my parents left ultimately i ended up in the hallowed portals with swami's grace when i entered swami's college i realized you know when i used to sit on the sands before i could seek admission the 11th and 12th class children were given admissions first and some of the bangalore boys who had finished their 11th and 12th from bangalore were permitted to come and study in degree college in puttaparthi so about 20 25 of them had come there and all these young boys used to sit in the veranda and i used to see that swami would come every day and talk to these boys and what would he talk we couldn't hear all we could hear was and see was that the boys were smiling and laughing a lot and they used to laugh there was there used to be so much of laughter in the veranda and we would wonder that uh, swami i expected him to be a serious kind of a god who would not talk much to people but here he was he was cracking jokes pulling on somebody's cheek giving a tapu on somebody's head and you know calling somebody a donna potu somebody a pakoda or somebody you know all kind of names and children would enjoy that it was like a, a scene for gods to be seen that god would be like a divine mother amongst his own children playing joking cracking jokes and making everybody laugh that was swami for us so i would wonder how does swami speak to the children in so many languages because i saw there were boys from kerala there were boys from tamil nadu there were boys from of course from andhra there were boys from karnataka boys from north of india from odisha even boys from abroad and i saw amongst my own classmates there were children from new zealand malaysia sri lanka australia america to name a few and i would wonder how is swami going to talk to all of them because i knew what i was the impression i was given that swami only speaks in telugu which is his mother tongue and uh, he manages to speak a little bit in english and maybe a wee bit in hindi but the first day when i joined into swami's college i was sitting in the veranda and i was wondering and trying to judge as to how is swami going to talk to the boys so i saw him walk in walking towards one of the boys and he looked like a south indian and uh, swami spoke to him something uh, in telugu probably that was an easy guess even i guess that that was a south indian boy and i said okay swami is going to talk to him in telugu so swami spoke to him something and a few boys around him smiled and laughed and then swami moved ahead 
Then there was one more boy. He also apparently looked like a South Indian. So I said, Swami is going to talk to him again in his mother tongue. Now I heard a different kind of a South Indian language. It may have been Tamil or probably even uh, Malayalam. I couldn't make out. Then uh, the third person again seemed like a South Indian boy to me. I said, okay, Swami is going to talk to him also in a South Indian language. So to my surprise, Swami goes to him, looks into his eyes and very lovingly speaks. Where are you from, sir? In English, Swami says, where are you from, sir? This boy promptly gets up on his knees, folds his palms and says in an English with, his, with an American accent. And he says, Swami, I am from the United States of America. Why, oh, my God. Swami knew that this guy looks like a South Indian, but he knew only English. So Swami spoke to him in English. I said, wow, how does Swami manage to do it? And as I saw Swami coming towards me, so I said, let's see, Swami, what are you going to speak to me? I look a little bit like a South Indian. I'm a North Indian. I don't know any of the South Indian languages. So how are you going to talk to me? So Swami came, probably Swami judged what was going on in a doubting Thomas's brain and in my heart. So he came to me, smiled at me and asked me in Hindi, which is my mother tongue. And he asked me, Tum kidar se aya? meaning to say, where did you come from? I got up on my knees promptly and folded my hands and said, Swami, I'm from indoor. Yes, yes, you are from indoor, not from outdoor. Swami punned on the word indoor and he said, you are from indoor, not from outdoor. As if he was affirming to me that, yes, my child, you have come to the right spot. You are my very own. You have come from me. You have come from indoor. That was probably the starting of a beautiful love affair, which has lasted till now and probably would only get over with my last breath. So I realized that Swami would speak to all the children in whichever languages they knew. And I would often wonder, why, how could Swami manage to speak in so many languages? And then it came to me as a big surprise that Swami could speak fluently in Telugu, a little bit in Tamil. He could also speak Kannada. He was very well versed with English. Of course, he would speak to me in details in Hindi. So he knew these five languages extremely well. And all of us knew that Swami, when he says that there is only one language, the language of the heart, Swami means it because he's there in your heart. So whatever thoughts, whatever feelings which come to you, he doesn't need any languages for you to understand. He responds to you straight away. So soon after this episode happened, Swami, after a week or so, decided to go to Brindavan because the new session had begun in Brindavan also. And Swami wanted to be with the Brindavan boys. So after about, uh, and Swami promised before going, that I'm going to spend one month in Brindavan, one month in Puttaparthi. Earlier, I had only one college in Brindavan, but now I have two colleges. So one month in Brindavan, one month in Puttaparthi. So Swami left for a month and all of us were, uh, were feeling very heavy in our hearts because we, we couldn't afford to think that Swami is going to leave us and go. We were like those young babies who had just started to walk in Swami's presence. And, you know, one lesson we learned straight away from Swami's feet. Swami always would tell us that always respect three M's in your life. Always love and respect the three M's in your life. The first one, Swami said, respect your mother. Second, Swami said, respect your motherland. And third, Swami said, always respect your mother tongue. So that is where we understood that even though Swami knows all these languages to give respect to his mother tongue. He delivers his discourses in Telugu and somebody else translates it into English. Then Swami left for Vrindavan for a month and then we had the time to settle down, go to the college. In those days, the colleges were run out of the first floor of Isharama school and we were supposed to stay in the East Prashanti Old Boys Hostel, which is now Old Boys Hostel. We would live there. There was... Uh, we were living in extremely small spaces with only one space to keep your suitcase and another space to keep your bedding with no desk to sit on, no chairs to sit on, nothing to have, no, no privileges, no, 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 no advantages, but lots of Swami. We realized Swami would say that whenever I give you physical discomfort, I give a lot of myself to you. 
So always remember in life that whenever we are facing a little bit of physical discomfort, be it either way of being of ill health or due to some problems, remember that Swami wants to give a little bit of himself to you. That's why he's giving you that trouble. So it so happened that uh, when Swami was away, there was a contest, there was a elocution contest kept in the hostel, in the college, sorry. And the subject of the elocution contest was uh, my life in Sri Satya Sai College. And we were supposed to speak in English, in Telugu and in Hindi. So all the boys were given a choice that you could speak in either of these three, either of these languages, any of these languages. So a few boys gave their names in English. Some boys gave their names for Telugu. One or two boys gave their names for Hindi also. I was also asked by one of my friends that why don't you give your name? I heard that you can manage to speak. I said, no, no, I hardly speak. He said, no, no, you try and see if you can speak. So I also gave my name. And as uh, luck would have it with Bhagwan's enormous grace, that day when the elocution contest took place, I was uh, given the first prize in the elocution contest as the best speaker of the day. And then came a thought, a straight thought in my heart. I wish Swami was here in Puttaparthi. So that in the evening, if we were to go, Swami would ask, because Swami asks every day, what did you do today in the college? What did you eat in the hostel? And we would all tell Swami what we did. So Swami would ask me, hey, today there was an elocution contest. Who got the first prize? I would have got up on my knees and said, Swami, I spoke in Hindi and I got the first prize. And then Swami would have materialized vibhuti for me or given me Pat Namaskar. And he would have said, yes, good boy. You spoke well. I know. You know, some such thing. But that day, Swami was in Brindavan. And I was sitting in Puttuparthi. So that thought came and I said, okay, my bad luck, probably some other time. And on the same day, my brother who was in Brindavan there, it had been five or six days. Swami had already been there almost a week, more than a week. And uh, Swami had still not spoken to my brother. So my brother was feeling a little low that how come Swami has not spoken to me the first day when he came, he spoke to me, but it's been more than eight or nine days. And Swami has not talked to me at all. Have I done anything wrong? Why is Swami not talking to me? So in the evening, he had a duty in the botanical gardens. So the botanical garden required a lot of hard work to do because you had to till the land, put the grass, put the plants. So by the time he finished his duty in the botanical garden, he saw that the bhajans had already begun. And all the boys had taken their places all around Swami. Swami would sit on a chair with all the boys all around him. Unlike Puttaparthi or anywhere else, uh, some boys would just surround Swami and sit. And Swami would say, you sing Allah Bhajan, you sing Devi Bhajan, you sing Nam Bhajan, you sing Ganesha Bhajan. And then this is how the Bhajans would be conducted. And Swami would play the Talam. And where Swami was sitting, there was a window in the bungalow. So those boys who would come late would have darshans from the window. And it was known as I had only window darshan today. So my brother who came in late, he saw that even window darshan was not possible because there were two or three tall boys who were standing. My brother was six feet, two inches, uh, thoroughbred Punjabi, which he was, though he stood, extended his neck and stood on his ankles. He could barely see Swami. So he decided that bank opposite to the bungalow, there's a beautiful water pond. On that water pond, there was a statue of Krishna with a flute. So he was anyway feeling a little low. So he said, Swami, you are not talking to me. So what is the point in having darshans and pushing these boys and see you? I will rather go and have the darshans of Lord Krishna. At least he'll talk to me. You are not even talking to me. So now he went and sat in the near the water pond, looking at Lord Krishna with his back towards Swami. And then the bhajan was going on and he was swaying and singing full throatedly, oblivious of the fact that what is happening behind him because he was dead sure, Swami is surrounded by the boys and he's not going to come to me. He was sitting and singing and suddenly realized that the singing around him has stopped. But then he continued singing. The boys who were sitting around him were not singing. There were hardly three or four. And suddenly somebody came and gave him a tart, hard slap on his head. And he opened his eyes and he looked around and then he turned. Swami was standing behind him. And Swami did like this. Oh my God, he immediately turned around and Swami said, take Padnamishkar. He bent down, took Padnamishkar and Swami said, 
are i was looking for you in the evening i couldn't find you where were you so he said swami i was in the botanical garden oh yes i wanted to inform you that today there was a elocution contest in puttaparthi and you know what your brother your elder brother he got the first prize in that elocution contest so convey my blessings to him and tell him swami is very happy with him oh my god that is the first most beautiful experience i had of swami's grace that here in puttaparthi i prayed for him that i wish he was here and there he was hitting with one arrow he's hitting the two targets he talked to my brother also gave him pad namaskar spoke to him and inquired about me and blessed me also so then started a beautiful uh, foray into swami's uh, area where in swami would come and talk to us swami would bless us swami even took me for a beautiful play which was directed as ramakrishna paramhamsa and maybe one of these days when i get to speak to you on that play also because that will require a good long time to speak and the lessons learned during this play so but since i was talking about the languages i will talk to you how swami would work in the field of these languages so days kept on going it was the month of december december 1979 and in those days in those period whenever december would come soon after swami's birthday which was in november devotees from european countries americas new zealand australia canada from various places in the world all the whites they would do chartered flights and come down to puttaparthi in hordes there used to be scores of taxis coming down there because they were all chartered flights which would come there and what would these people do they would all sit down in groups learn carols practice carols carry candles early morning on a 25th morning and then sing those beautiful carols of silent night holy night all is calm all is quiet so you know those beautiful serene voices they would practice in those days anyone who has been in the late 70s and early 80s during christmas times they would know that it was like being in bethlehem it was like jerusalem it was not like puttaparthi you would see less of indians and more of foreigners so one day we saw that about a group of 40 to 50 italians came to puttaparthi for darshans and how did we know they were from italy they were all wearing white clothes white kurta pajama men folk ladies were wearing white sarees they had a blue scarf around them a big blue scarf and behind the scarf in red lettered word it was written italia so we knew that these people are from italy so the evening they came the afternoon they reached that evening our duty was in the kyalda stores those were the general stores then near the south prashanti where people who wanted to have some toothbrush or shaving cream or brush or napkins or buckets or mugs or whatever soap shampoo etc they could come and buy it so we were giving duty there and we realized this 40 people these italians came down there and uh, none of them knew english like they would you know with actions show that they wanted a soap or they wanted a toothpaste or they wanted a brush we would ask them for 10 rupee they would give us 100 rupee and say sai ram and go back and we had to call them saying no no please come take your money back it's only 10 bucks so we realized that none of them knew english so as we closed the stores around 8 o'clock we were going for our dinner there were three more boys who were my senior friends who had come from brindavan so i asked them i said if swami is to give interview to all these italians how is swami going to talk to them so my friends told after thought well none of them know english so it's going to be very difficult how is swami going to talk so then one of them said i'm sure one of them in the group will know english so what will happen is swami will give his discourse in english and this gentleman who knows english will translate it into italian and so everybody will understand and swami will talk to them so the talk happened it came and went next day evening when we sat for darshans i got to sit in the front row uh, right in the front row where sami would open his door and first he would look at you and smile so the moment it was 4 o'clock sami opened the door he looked at me i was sitting right in the front i folded my palms and i gave the best 70 mm smile i had and sami looked at me and smiled and then sami turned to the lady's side and took that beautiful round and those were the days when there were sands in puttaparthi 
and there would be wind blowing and Swami would seem to glide on the sand. It wasn't as he was walking on the floor. He was like walking, in, he was walking, but he would seem to be gliding on the sand. It was a sight for gods to see. Wherever Swami would go, people would take a handful of the sand, put it in their handkerchief or in their hands and probably apply it on their forehead and thank themselves and maybe keep that charanadhuli of Bhagwan as a memory that they had been to Puttaparthi. I saw scores of devotees doing this. So Swami would go. So the, when he passed by the Italian group, the ladies were all showing letters to Swami. Swami just waved at them and gave them Abhay Hasta, but did not talk to them and did not accept their letters. Then Swami completed the round with the ladies. So now we turned around and sat with looking at the Jain side. So the moment Swami entered the Jain side, the Italian people were sitting in the group, the, wearing those blue scarves, uh, and we could see that the Italian group was there. So Swami stopped in front of the leader who was sitting in the front. And Swami spoke to him and said, Italy? So he understood. He shook his head. Yes, Swami. He did like this. Swami said, go inside. Now he did not understand what Swami has said. Swami said, again, go inside. He still did not understand. He kept looking at Swami and waving his head. Then Swami looked at him, Papam, that look which Swami gave. That I am inviting him for an interview, but no prapti here. And Swami walked and continued giving darshans and accepting letters from the others. Then there was Mr. Antonio Craxi, the brother of uh, Bettino Craxi, who was the then uh, Prime Minister of Italy. Mr. Antonio Craxi was living in Puttaparthi. He came running and uh, from the behind uh, the gen side and told something in Italian to this group. So immediately there was an electric shock in all of them when they understood that Swami is invited us for an interview and we are sitting like dodos. So they got up all and very hurriedly looked at Swami and praying to Swami in their own minds and uh, folding their hands. They started walking towards the interview room and they immediately waved at the lady's side. The ladies also got up and probably that was a message which Swami had given and uh, Mr. Kraxi supported them and told them to come. Now the gents of course sat in the upper veranda When the ladies came, they sat right in front of me. There was hardly a gap of eight or nine feet between me and the ladies. When Swami finished his darshans and he walked through the students and came and stood in front of the ladies. As he stood in front of the ladies, he looked at me first, very, gave a very quizzical look to me. And then he went to one of the ladies. I remember still she was wearing some brown flowing dress and she was holding a letter and she had almost tearful eyes. Tears were not dropping, but you could see that she was constantly praying with her lips moving and she was probably praying Swami to come and accept her letter. The moment Swami saw that, Swami went, took that letter and spoke something which was neither English, nor Hindi, nor Telugu, nor Tamil, nor any South Indian language. It was something like Italian to my ears. And the moment Swami spoke something in Italian, this lady fell at Swami's feet crying and she probably, you know, uh, gave Swami a bath from her tears of gratitude or whatever Swami must have said. And she was thankful to Swami and she kept on speaking something in Italian, which none of us understood. But then Swami understood that Swami kept on consoling her. Then Swami looked at me and came straight towards me, hardly a gap of seven or eight feet. And then what Swami told, it was in English, I'll repeat to you. Swami smilingly looked at me and he said, Outside, I show I don't know anything, but inside, I know everything. And he looked at me and did like this. So I knew that the message was for me because last night itself, I was talking that how is Swami going to speak to these people in Italian? And here, right before my very eyes, I heard with my own ears, Swami speak to that lady something in Italian. Now, these people were taken inside the interview room for an interview and after about half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever must have been the time, they came out thoroughly blessed, feeling very happy with tears flowing from their eyes and with so much of gratitude in their hearts. We could see they were all bending down again and again and Swami was blessing them with Abhayasta sometimes with both his hands and telling them to move on, move on and as they moved on, Swami kept on looking at them. So after the bhajans were over, I decided to go and approach Mr. Craxi and I asked him, I said, sir, I was very excited. I said, sir, I heard Swami speak in Italian. I mean, it was a miracle. How could, do you know that Swami speaks in Italian? 
so he looked at me like a you know a big person looks at a small little child a teacher looks at a small little child who's in kg1 he said yes the when i came from italy even i did not speak very good english so he still speaks to me in italian only in the interviews it is only outside that he speaks to me in english otherwise in the room he talks to me in italian only so we asked him uh, what did swami talk to this lady so then he said that this lady had never seen swami she had never heard about swami she had never read any swami's book she was going from one church to the other lighting candles for her young little daughter who was given only about a month to live because she was suffering with cancer and the doctors had asked her to take home from the hospital so because of the christmas season coming she was going from one church to the other so in one church she heard people singing bhajans and carols so she asked you were talking about some satya sai baba who is this man they said oh don't you know a uh, jesus christ has come in south of india in bangalore we are going to go and for his darshans in puttaparthi why don't you also come along so when she heard that a person like jesus christ has come in india she said okay i am coming with you she had never heard about swami only with that implicit faith that jesus christ has come to india she booked herself in the next one week she found herself in puttaparthi the moment they came the next day swami called them for an interview and right in front of me swami spoke to her and told her cancer cancel amma don't worry i'm going to take care of your child your daughter is going to be okay after speaking that swami accepted a letter which probably had the same prayer and then swami came and spoke to me and told me that i know everything inside so this is how swami would open our eyes and teach us that how he is the universal god for him languages can be no bars for him people doesn't matter all he looks at is the hearts of people any heart which is full of devotion swami would always respond to that heart even now even swami is not there unfortunately with us physically i am telling you this with supreme confidence that even if you were to pray to bhagwan's picture with that supreme love and confidence in your heart he is going to respond because swami says if you want to feel my presence always treat my picture like god stop treating god like a picture when you treat my picture as a god i respond to you but you treat picture when you treat god merely as a picture and just hang it in your room then i am unable to respond to you so that is how each one of us has to learn how to pray to bhagwan and treat the picture which is there in our house as virtually god why we talking of languages i'm again reminded of a very beautiful episode uh a little later though it so happened that one of my friends got an interview he would get lots of interviews so one day uh, around christmas time only there was a huge contingent of american devotees and as you know that american devotees all speak english so sami would uh, call all the american devotees who have come in a group because they would be all wearing the same colored scarves so people would know that they are from a particular contingent so sami called this group of american devotees for an interview and what would sami do sami is very courteous you know there are certain things we must all learn from sami when sami would stand and take everybody for an interview he would stand on the door open the interview room door and one by one invite everybody inside once everybody is inside sami would gradually make his way turn on the light first turn on the fan then close the door and then sit down on the chair see being the host being god himself he would first make his devotees sit around him and then go and sit on the chair and as sami would sit on the chair if it was a telugu group sami would say aim samacharam ipudu charu and the sami would start speaking something in telugu if it was a group which knew english sami said yes sir what is the news and somebody would speak something and then sami would take on from there and give a impromptu discourse if it is a hindi group sami would say kya khabar hai tum log kabhi aaya delhi se humko batao kya karta and then somebody would speak something and then sami would respond to that and then give a on the spot discourse so that day sami looked around it was all americans so everybody knew that now we are in for a treat and sami is going to speak to us and give us a discourse in english and sami the moment he sat on the chair he said first thing divyatma swarupalara hm em samacharam 
and then Swami started speaking in fluent Telugu. For almost four or five minutes, Swami kept on speaking in Telugu. Everybody started looking at each other that who knows Telugu, who's going to translate. And then suddenly Swami stopped after speaking one or two paragraphs. Swami said, oh, ho, I forgot. You guys don't speak Telugu. You speak only English. Now, um, who's going to translate my discourse today? Today, I want to speak in Telugu. So who's going to translate it into English? You, you, you. He said, no, 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 Swami, we don't know. Then he saw there was a young boy of 16 or 17 years of age. Swami said, ah, you, you translate my discourse. Swami said, he said, Swami, but I don't know Telugu. Shh, you translate my discourse. End of matter. And then Swami started speaking. From one side, Swami would speak in Telugu. From the other side, this guy would speak in his anglicized English. And the people that day, I'm sure, witnessed a miracle happening in front of their eyes. That the boy who was merely 16 or 17 years of age, who had never been to Puttaparthi, how is he able to comprehend Telugu so well that he's able to translate Swami's discourse into perfect American English? And that day, I'm sure nobody heard the discourse because sometimes they would look at the boy, other times they would look at Swami and would wonder what is happening. Like a ball of game of ping pong that the ball goes here, the ball goes there. And they would wonder what is Swami, what is happening there? After the interview got over, everyone came out and they were all beaming because they saw a miracle happening there. And then one of the devotees came and congratulated that young boy and told him, my God, you are so lucky. I'm sure you must have bought that book, learn Telugu in 30 days and you must have practiced in America and Swami must have known about it. So he asked you to translate his discourse into from Telugu to English. He said, what are you talking? What Telugu, Telugu you guys are saying? Are, we were all inside. We heard Swami speak Telugu and you translated it in English. So what more? We, it's nothing short of a miracle. He said, yes, it is a miracle. But understand and listen what I have to say. He said, what? He said, when I told Swami, the Swami, I cannot understand Telugu. Swami said, Shh, keep quiet, sit down. You translate. I heard Swami speak in colloquial English only. Only thing his accent was Indian. Whatever Swami spoke, adverbitum, I again spoke the same thing only in an American accent. So imagine almost 45 people sitting in the group. 44 were listening Swami speak in Telugu, but the person who was asked to translate Swami's discourse heard Swami speak it in English. What more proof do you require of his divinity wherein he plays with the people around him, he plays with the situation. And you know, the best part of Bhagwan and his divinity is he never repeats a miracle. Whatever he does, I don't know. He must have written by now. I'm sure Swami must be having an encyclopedia of how to surprise my devotees with different kinds of miracles. And he, what he would do with you, he would not do with me. What he would do with me, he would not do it with Suresh Garu. What he would do with Suresh sir, he may not do it with anybody else. So each person has huge miracles. And trust me, if all of us were to sit down and write a Sai Bhagavatam. Each one of us is capable of writing at least from a small booklet to a thick novel about how Swami influenced my life, how Swami changed my life, how Swami's love made me see things in a better perspective, how Swami's miracle gave me the confidence that God is walking this earth. I think we have to be perpetually thankful to Swami for having brought us into his fold at the time. In Kali Yuga, when there is the easiest way to reach Godhood is Namasmarana and Seva. And Swami taught us these things. He's given us the opportunity. I'm given to understand that even before this talk took place, there was a one hour bhajan. So we are involving ourselves into these activities of not only Parayanam, not only hearing a story, but we are also doing Namasmaranam, we are also doing Seva. So that way, Swami is giving us an opportunity to write off our karmas and come running towards Him because the Divine Mother is waiting to engulf all of us so that we merge. And Swami says that anyone who has joined this organization and does seva with full faith and follows all the routine, this will be the last birth for all of them. You read the first charter which was given by Swami. Swami said, I will take care of you. I will take care of your children and I will take care of the children of your children also. And I will ensure that all of them will reach Swami's feet. What a great assurance 
just read the charter of the organization which Swami had given way back in early 70s. The charter says, so imagine all of us are so lucky that Swami has kept us in his fold. He has kept us around him. He's giving us, even when he's not there, he's giving us an opportunity to do seva. He's giving us an opportunity to do namasmarna. He's giving an opportunity to improve ourselves every day. We did not look outside and try to see how I can influence the others. Just look into the mirror and find out, am I a better individual than what I was yesterday? If the answer is no, then I think we must try a little more hard. Try to be a better individual so that every time I look myself in the mirror, the mirror says, yes, Mr. Seshteva, today you are a shade better because of Swami's grace. We need to constantly take stock of our own abilities to be good. We should not be bothering about the world. Problem with all of us is we are constantly looking outwards. You know, if someone tells us that uh, what are the good qualities in us, so we probably can list so many good qualities. But when we ask them to find good qualities in others, we can't see any good qualities in them. I'm reminded of a very beautiful episode in my college days when I was in my MCOM. There was a lecturer, there was a subject uh, which was there. It was known as organization behavior. This subject, the first of its kind when it was started in the university, Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning. So we had a clinical psychiatrist from Canada by name Dr. Shankar Dutta who had come and taught us, for, he stayed there for a good three months. He took a sabbatical from his university and he taught us and I had soft to him. He was a wonderful man. I learned a lot from him. One day he gave us a beautiful exercise in the classroom. Would you like to do this exercise? Okay. So take up a pen and take a paper. And then he told us in the next three minutes, write down three good qualities in you. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I'll repeat again. He told, write down three bad qualities in you in the next three minutes. Write down three negative qualities in yourself in the next three minutes. So we all took a paper and a pen and we started writing. And when the three minutes got over, we never knew. It was four minutes, it was five minutes, it was six minutes, but we could not finish. Then ultimately after six minutes, it's a time over. I told you three minutes, it is six minutes. And I asked you to write at least three which three negative qualities in you. How many of you have written three negative qualities? We looked around. There was nobody in the class who could write three, three wrong uh, negative qualities in oneself. Then one boy very sheepishly, you know, raised his hand that, oh my God, I am the sinner in the class. I have three negative qualities. He looked at that boy. He said, okay, good. You could identify three bad qualities. How many of you could identify two bad qualities in yourself? Now, quite a few of us raised our hands that uh, we could identify two bad qualities. He said, you all need to work hard on yourself because you are able to see your own bad qualities. Then he said, how many if you have only one quality? Now, there were two or three boys, mainly the front benchers who were the more studious kinds. They raised their hands and looked around like winners that I have only one bad quality. Then he said, okay, how many boys do not have any negative quality in them? So there was this one lone ranger he stood his and raised his hand confidently. He said, wow, you are the chosen one. You have no bad quality in you. Great. Sit down. Now, another exercise. Take up another paper. Take the pen again. Sit down. I'm going to give you five minutes now. Write down three negative qualities of your best friend who's sharing the bench with you. He said, write down three negative qualities of your best friend who's sharing the bench with you. I give you five minutes for it. Now the tick tock, tick tock, the clock went five minutes in less than three minutes. We wrote three bad qualities, four bad qualities. One guy managed to write seven to eight bad qualities of his best friend who was sharing his bench. So there ended the exercise. And then he said, what did you learn out of it? The lesson is it is so much more easier for us to find out the faults of the others rather than finding our own faults. See, there was only one boy who could identify three faults in him. Most of you could identify only two faults. There were one or two who had only one fault. And one of my young friends did not have any fault at all, which is so difficult. But the same guy who had no fault, his friend is able, able to identify at least three to four faults in him. So he said, Swami teaches us that when you point a finger towards one person and says, you have this problem, 
You forget that three fingers are pointing towards you. So never point a finger at other people. Just identify your own faults and offer them at the lotus feet of Bhagwan and pray that he makes you a better human being so that we all are able to prove our we are able to prove our worth to Swami. You know, it was George Bernard Shaw, the English, famous English writer, who would say that forget about the world. Don't try to connect the world. Just change yourself and you can be sure that there would be one scoundrel less in the society. So this is what we have to do. We have to ensure that we have to correct only ourselves and we don't need to worry about the rest of the world. So I'm reminded of another beautiful episode because once when I was in a, to a talk, a person asked me, sir, please give us something about a real life miracle which you have seen in uh, Swami's presence. So it was the month of January 1980. The Makar Sankranti holidays were declared. The students who were living in and around Puttaparthi up to Hyderabad, they all decided to go and celebrate Makar Sankranti and Pongal in their houses. Boys at Chennai also left. There were hardly about 35, 40 boys who were there, like those of us who had come from north of India, and we couldn't have gone and come back in three, four days. So we chose to stay back. That day, I think it was 15th of January or 16th of January, probably 15th of January, we saw that there was an old devotee of Swami. He was almost 70 years of age, a tall, very, very fair colored man. His name was Mr. S. N. Singh. He used to be the owner of a chain of hotels in Kolkata. And he was instrumental in construction of a hostel, boys hostel in Vrindavan. There are two blocks. One is a Singh block and one is a Walter Coven block. So the Essen Singh block was contributed by him. So he would wear always safari suits. Always. If you would wear a white safari, he would wear a Gandhi topi, which was white. If you would wear a grey safari, there would be a grey colored same Gandhi topi. So Swami would sometimes lovingly call him Topi. So one day he was sitting there and Swami called him, hey Topi. So he got up and he came running to Swami. He spoke to Swami and I remember Swami used to love him a lot. He was a fairly senior man, but Swami would treat him like his own uh, friend. You know, it was like a Sakha Bhakti Bhav which he had. So one day, that day we saw that he was sitting and uh, Swami came. So he had the letter in his hand. He got up on his knees to give to Swami. Swami accepted the letter and Swami asked him in Hindi, Kya hua? So he said, Swami, my uncle has come from Calcutta and uh, he is a, a lame man. He has never walked. He's sitting on a wheelchair and I pray that you bless him, Swami. So Swami said, okay, call him. So then he said, Swami, uh, he's sitting on a wheelchair. What should I do? So Swami then looked and came, walked across the boys in the veranda. And we saw that on East Prashanti, on the gate, there was a man's a huge man must have been 140 kilos or so sitting on a wheelchair and uh, not moving at all and there was a servant who was standing there so Swami told pointed towards the servant that bring the wheelchair the servant he was a thin fellow he tried his level best to push the chair but because those were the days there were sands on Puttaparthi he could not pull the wheelchair very efficiently so Swami looked at a few of us and said go help him so the two or three of us boys we rushed down there and push the wheelchair and then there was a slope up there when the veranda comes. So the wheelchair came there and Swami made us stop the wheelchair and we all sat down. And then Swami was joking all this while with Mr. Singh and even the uncle. Then Swami said, why can't you walk? Why are you sitting on this wheelchair? Come on. I want to give you an interview. You come. You come inside. So he tried his level best to get up, but he could just move a few inches and then he fell back again in the chair. Then Swami got very serious. Swami said, if you want an interview, get up and walk. He again tried his level best. He could not get up. Imagine a 140 years old man. And then Swami said, he has not walked for 25 years. But today you will walk. And then suddenly Swami's expressions changed. Swami took one step back and Swami waved his arm. And there came Vibhuti. Swami applied the Vibhuti on his forehead. Swami applied Vibhuti on his neck and whatever remaining Vibhuti was there, Swami put it on his knees and gave two hard slaps on his knees. I saw Swami's face. It was very serious, very godlike. And Swami gave two slaps on his knees and then said only three words. Get up and walk. That was like God of the universe commanding him to get up. This man, as if in a trance, he took a second, he got up. 
he took the first step he took the second step and as he took the third step he was about to fall and swami just caught hold of him by the tip of his fingers and swami just caught hold of him like that and then swami kept on moving back taking him with him to the interview and right in front of our eyes this man who had never walked for 25 years he went walking to the interview room and fair enough after 10 minutes very shortly swami sent him out and we saw his as if swami had given him a vibhuti bath his full face was full of vibhuti only those places where the tears of gratitude were falling like ganga and yamuna those places had been marked and his eyes were full of tears and he was constantly looking at swami and saying thank you thank you and swami kept on blessing him first with one hand then both hands and kept on saying go 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 jao ja ke betho and then he went walking all through the corridor he went to the veranda went through the slope and went to the east prashanti and there is ambassador car was parked he caught hold of the ambassador car and kept on looking at swami and kept on crying like a child and then swami you know like a small little child came to all of us who were sitting behind at the end of the portico and he says dekha dekha you saw what i did today this man had not walked for 25 years see swami made him walk today how happy is feeling see 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 so you know like a small little child who has got something or who wants to show it to everybody swami had that expression of love on his face and he was saying see i made him walk today you see see how happy is feeling we all turned around we all turned around saw him crying and then suddenly Swami started looking into the open sky, and his hands started moving as if giving some kind of a response to some unseen forces there. And then in Hindi, Swami said, "Kya faida? Kya faida? Itna nokar, itna paisa, kis kam ka?" Then he said, "What is the use? What is the use? This man had so much money, so many servants. What use did they come to him?" Then he said. For 25 years, this man has not walked. He has just sat on a chair. Today, with Bhagwan's grace, he is walking. Now he will walk. And again, that face, that divine, ex, that uh, facial expression which came, which as if it was a soliloquy where Swami was talking to himself. There was nobody around. Swami just spoke to him, gave the message to the universe that today, see, he is walking. And then Swami was back to normal, cracking jokes, and he forgot about that, as if Swami had done it. so this is the way swami would instill faith into our young hearts to prove to us that look there is a miracle happening around you every second every minute if you keep your eyes open you will be able to notice then you know swami is very fond of his devotees swami would often tell us boys when he would point to the devotees and he would say you know who these people are and we would say swami are devotees he would say swami said no no Swami said I am like a lotus flower and who comes to the lotus the bees come to the lotus and what do they do they take the nectar of the lotus and go back and build their houses build their homes all these foreigners you see all these devotees you see they are the ones who are like bees they come to swami they take the best of bhagwan go back and build their lives and you know when there is a water when there is water body there is a pond where there is a lotus flower there are those huge green leaves also which the lotus has and you know who sits on those green leaves we did not know what to say swami said that uh, frogs sit on the lotus leaves and you know who the frogs are and we did not we shook our heads swami we do not know swami said you are the frogs you sit near the lotus but you are not able to take the nectar of the lotus whereas my devotees are like those bees who come to me take my nectar and build their homes i want that you should also become like those bees take my nectar and build your homes so just imagine in such a great ex extent swami used to hold all his devotees in such a high esteem that he would say that they are like bees who come and take my nectar one day swami had called us for an interview and swami was talking to us on the power of prayer he was talking to us how we should pray to god so as we were talking then swami said you know uh, all these devotees who come to me 
they always come it as a business you know they all want something from baba they all want something from swami somebody wants a name somebody wants fame somebody wants power somebody wants money somebody wants bungalow somebody wants car they all want these kinds of things so swami is going on and on on the power of prayer and what the devotees ask now before i finish this episode i will tell you a small little incident which is connected to it every day after bhajans would get over in the evening there would be a meditation session in the prayer hall in puttaparthi after the meditation session would get over i would attend it after it would get over i would quietly come out and as you would walk towards the dashavatar gate which was there then there was a beautiful statue of lord ganesha so i would come and pray to the statue of lord ganesha and i would always come and pray for vidya and sadbuddhi why vidya because swami had said that knowledge is that ornament no thief can take away from you so i would always pray for vidya and why sadbuddhi because if you have sadbuddhi you will walk the right path as shown by bhagwan so day in and day out every day i would come and pray to lord ganesha about vidya sadbuddhi vidya sadbuddhi so that day swami decided that i must tell all my devotees and all my students what they must pray to me so that day he started giving a impromptu discourse to all of us that what you should pray then he told all my devotees they come as a business to swami they all want something to swami something from swami they want name fame power money bungalow car job this that somebody wants to get their daughter married somebody wants a child somebody wants a grandchild somebody wants employment for his son they are always asking these material things from swami and then he looked straight in my eyes i was sitting straight at near swami's feet swami said pointed towards me but there are some devotees they don't ask me for worldly things they ask me for vidya and sadbuddhi and he looked at me and he said no so i said you saw me i shook my head because i was always asking for vidya and sadbuddhi then swami said why do you ask for these worldly things from swami why do you ask for name fame power money vidya sadbuddhi these are all worldly things do not ask see whatever little understanding the small understanding i had i always thought let me not ask anything worldly so i will ask vidya and sadbuddhi so swami said you should not even ask for vidya and sadbuddhi and then swami said do you know what you must ask in your prayers so we got little closer to swami we knew that now swami is going to give us some kind of a uh, insight into what we should pray then swami said in your prayers do not ask any material things from god ever if you ask for money you will only get money but you will also get income tax problems jokingly he said if you ask for name you will only get name maybe no fame no power no money but if you ask in your prayers only for me and me alone if you ask in your prayers only for god then you know god has everything in his hand in his whole hand he has name fame power money vidya sadbuddhi everything is in his hand if you ask for god and god alone god gives you everything i have come to give you everything why do you ask for these small little trinkets that get my daughter married get me a child get me a job do this for me get me a car get me a bigger bungalow do this don't ask for them god knows god is your divine mother the universal mother god knows when is the right time to give you what so do not ask for these worldly things ask for me and me alone so dear brothers and sisters it was september 1979 when swami told us this revelation and from that day it has been my genuine effort from my side that we have never asked any worldly things from swami i always pray for him and him alone and the great grand mother which swami is the the divine universal mother which swami is he knows what you need he'll give you unasked he knows what my child wants he will give you just pray for him and him alone because when he is there with you everything is with you then swami continued he said it was the war of mahabharata which was to be fought and one day lord krishna was reclining on his bed taking an afternoon siesta so duryodhana came and sat next to his pillow after 10 minutes arjuna came and sat on his feet and as lord krishna opened his eyes so he saw arjuna sitting on his feet and he said are path when did you come so duryodhana <clears throat> cleared his throat and he said swami i am also sitting here so he made him sit near his eyes near his feet so where he could see him clearly and then he said why have the two of you come together so duryodhana said sir 
the lord of mahabhar the, the war of mahabharata is to be fought so we have come to invite and seek your blessings and want that whose side will you fight this war of mahabharata from because wherever you will be there that team is sure to win so uh, duryodhana said lord i have come first so i should be given the first choice that you should fight from our side so krishna heard them patiently and lord krishna said okay i am giving you a choice on one side will be my full army with their horses chariots camels elephants armory the total army and on the other side would be me that too unarmed i will be there only in advisory capacity i will not fight i have laid down my arms i will not fight so whom do you want now so duryodhana sat thought for a while and he said to advise me dronacharya is there bhishma pitama is there my friend karna is there shakuni my mama is there why should i ask another advisor who is not going to fight lord krishna is a great fighter a great warrior but then if he is not going to take the war i think i'd rather take his army so he said lord please give me your army i'll be happy then arjuna fell down at feet of lord krishna and he said lord i wanted only you so if you are from my side now i know victory will be ours and then swami said now you know the history when arjuna chose lord krishna over the world what did he get he got name he got fame he got power he got the kingdom he got vidya he got sadbuddhi he even got the gita pravachan he got the gita gyan which nobody got and what happened to duryodhana he lost his life and he was left without anything so swami said in this war of mahabharata which you are facing in your daily lives do not forget to remember god always constantly with every breath pray for him and him alone and when you pray for him swami said i give you everything because i am your divine mother i know what you need and when you ask me what you need just pray for me and i will grant you everything you've been so kind to have invited me over for this small little session wherein we could speak a little about swami and as i always say that when you talk about bhagwan and his experiences the first beneficiary are not the listeners the first beneficiary is the one who's giving the talk because as he talks he's reliving those moments and when you relive those moments you are charging your own spiritual battery so thank you dear brothers and sisters from chennai for being so kind for giving me this opportunity to give to have this wonderful satsang wherein i could relive those beautiful moments of swami and as i talked with you as i spoke about those moments i again thought it was 1979 it was 1980 it was 1981 and i was taken back into the flight of fancy and i still realized that i was sitting like a small little young boy who had not seen this world who had only experienced swami in his fullness in his beauty and his sweetness and the taste of that sweetness is still there in the memory still there in your taste still there in your heart and i pray that this kind of a love and sweetness lasts for a lifetime in your memory thank you so much jay sai ram uh, sai ram we thank you shri tribhuvan sachdeva for this wonderful journey of yours with sai so we have got about four questions uh rather five questions from the audience so would like to just uh, shoot out one by one the first question is sairam sir happy to know that you are part of the prashant bhajan group any particular song which you have sung in front of our beloved swami which swami enjoyed kindly sing a bhajan please few lines sorry sir i couldn't hear your question yeah sir sairam sir happy to know that you were part of the prashanti bhajan group yeah particular song which you have sung in front of our beloved bhagwan which swami enjoyed can okay. you sing a few lines of that bhajan all right all right there was one song which was uh, swami would also sing sometimes and when my memory goes i have sung this song often before swami i'll sing a few lines it's a small namavali जय जय प्रभु गिरिधारी नटवर नंदलाला नटवर नंदलाला हे गिरिधर गोपाला 
नचवर नंद लाला हे गिरिधर गोपाला 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 जय जय प्रभु गिरिधारी नटवर नंद लाला so beautiful sairam it's uh, melodious even after uh, so many years we enjoyed your bhajan so, sairam sir second question what is your message for balvika students balvika's gurus and youths has swami specifically said anything about balvika's movement to you or your father as he was the state president see bal vikas is the most important activity which swami has given to our sisters and brothers in the organization swami has always believed that when you are young when you are small you are of the impressionable age your mind is like a sponge whatever you give it it soaks like a water inside if you give them the good samskaras if you give them the good bhavas if you teach them how to pray if you teach them the right prayers the child's attitude develops swami said the gurus are not the one who are going to decide the destiny of the child it is god who is going to do it but what is the work guru has to do the guru's work is like a gardener who sows a beautiful seed of samskara into the mind and hearts of the child and as the water of time is poured on that a beautiful tree grows in under which all people who are tired who who walk that road they can come and take rest and swami said that it is bal vikas when you spread it amongst all the children they learn about the culture they learn about the indian values they learn about god and godhood and this is what gives you strength we hear these days you know all these film stars these wrong heroes committing suicide why because they do not have inner resources they do not have a lord inside who can report to them when they are feeling a low in their life but when you learn how to pray you know how do you pray for praying you have to bow down you have to cut your ego you have to bow before god and pray to him that lord i am yours treat me like an instrument but please give me the strength when you do that strength is bound to come to you so when you go to bal vikas you are teaching children how to pray and when you are teaching them how to pray you are giving them a link of god so this is the greatest activity which swami has taught about indian culture and spirituality and that is the crux of our major activities through the bal vikas the children grow up to become pre seva dal they come into seva dal and then today like i said that i was a bal vikas student and today i am yet in the organization so i still remember those beautiful stories which were told to me during bal vikas those beautiful bhajans which were told to me and i still remember all those gurus who had taught me and i feel that i i remember them with a heart full of gratitude that they had taught me how to go on the right path thank you sir you have enlightened the bal vikas and bal vikas gurus with your uh, message and more, more so you have also covered in today's scenario how youths are not uh, steady constant in their prayers thank you the third question sir how could swami help us to tide over disappointments in spite of honest work can there be a suggestion hmm swami says sometimes when we are doing it honestly when we do it honestly we are answerable only to god where in this in this world people do not really do so much work as if they want to show that they are doing work so people get impressed by the show which they do but remember when your last time comes god is not going to put a measuring tape around your pocket as to how much money you had made how much property you had made how many bungalows you had made that measuring tape will be around your heart how many people did you forgive how many people did you not cheat how many people you could have done so much harm but you behaved honestly so honesty is a virtue as swami would say 
that honesty can be troubled, but it cannot be defeated. As he says, Satyam Vada Dharmam Chara. So it has to be practiced because if everybody says that the world is not following honesty, why should I also be honest? So there will be total dishonesty. But you have to be honest. And when you are honest, you will find that the value will trickle down to your children also, to your grandchildren also. So this is one virtue which Swami has taught us. We should not feel defeated by it. But honesty doesn't mean being foolhardy. Swami gives an example that there is a man who is being chased by some people who have swords in their hands. The man goes and he hides behind a bush. There is a saint who is meditating and who is about to finish his meditation. He sees this man, comes and hides, hides behind that bush. And the saint is known never to utter a lie. He is an honest man. So now this guy with a sword comes to him and asks him, where is that man who was running here? So what should that person do? Should he follow honesty and say, ah, he's sitting behind that bush, catch him. What does he say? Oh, I saw him go in that left direction. So those men with the sword go back. Your honesty, your truthfulness should not hurt others. Truthfulness should be used for yourself. Truthfulness should be used for a better of society, for the general good of others. Truthfulness is a habit that if you practice it in your words, what will come out will be a loving creature. Swami says that when you speak truth in your words always, you will be a very loving person who will have the power of doing what you say. So those people who are always following truth, their words have great power. People believe them, people follow them and you are an automatic leader. But your truth should not hurt others. Sometimes, you know, when you sing, you may not have sung very well. Huh? So then someone comes and asks, sir, how did I sing? Now he's come with an enthusiasm. A small little baby comes to you, a small little child. And he says, oh, you sa sang like a donkey. So it's now you told the truth. He was actually singing like a donkey. Now you said, no, I'm being honest because Swami told me to be honest. Huh? But second thing you say that, well, you sang well. It was good for the first attempt. But I think you need to practice more. Huh? When you practice more, you can even become better. Now see how you've been honest, but then you have not hurt a person. So your honesty should not be like a knife. It should be like that love which slowly trickles down without hurting others. Yeah. Very well said, sir, about honesty and truthfulness. The next question is, we shall be obliged to know how Swami's students, that is, Swami's asserts have planned their action, planned by way of their contribution to Bharat, Sai Mission. Kindly share. See, just now I spoke to you you know, when uh, I was a young student, when I finished my MCOM, I taught in the university for two years. Then Swami permitted me that you must go back to Indore, complete your law and join your father's law firm because I have made him the state president of Madhya Pradesh. And that time there was no Chhattisgarh, so it was one big Madhya Pradesh and he has to travel a lot. So I came with that feeling, oh, Swami has said that my boys are going to carry my flag forward. So they are going to change the world. So I said, watch out world, here I come. I'm going to change the world. But then when I reached Indore, I realized the world was too big. I realized I couldn't change the world. So I said, okay, let me try changing India first because India needs to be changed. And what should I do? I must transform everybody from all what I have understood from Swami by telling them all what Swami's discourses are. But in India, nobody was bothered. Nobody knew what you are. Then I said, okay, let me make my scope a little less. Let me stay, change the state of Madhya Pradesh. At least those who are Swami's devotees would listen to me. But then even I realized they had no time. Then I thought, okay, let me change my city of Indore. Uh, then I'll be able to change this town because Swami said that the students are going to change this country. So let me start with Indore. But when I stood on the crossroads in Indore, people just looked at me and laughed at me and said, what do you want to change? What will you change? What are you? Nobody gave me any of this thing. Then I thought, let me change my colony. Huh? Then I thought, let me change my colony. But in my colony also, nobody took me seriously. Then I realized there is one person I can change. Let me try to change my spouse. Huh? What a foolish decision. Has any person been able to ever change his spouse? So then I told my spouse, I'm going to change you. So my spouse looked at me very pathetically and she taught me a lesson. She said, first you change yourself. And then I understood the message of Swami. That the change is not of the country per se. When the boys who study in these hallowed portals and go out 
and then they change themselves. When you change, looking at you, your spouse will change. And when your spouse changes, the family changes. When the family changes, the colony will say, oh, these people are such good people. They do Namasman regularly. They indulge into Narayan Seva. We should also contribute for Narayan Seva. The colony changes. When the colony changes, they all do Narayan Seva. They do all Namasmaran. They do all Nagar Sankirtanam. Then the city of Chennai changes. Now the city of Chennai changes. The whole Tamil Nadu changes. When the Tamil Nadu state changes, the south of India changes. When the south of India changes, as it is changing, the whole country changes. When the whole country changes, the whole world changes. But Swami says, the change has to be first within you. As I said, the first scoundrel is us. We have to change ourselves. When we change ourselves, people who get in touch with you will automatically change because that divinity will touch all of them. So you have to be full of conviction, full of values, full of truthfulness, full of good qualities so that wherever you go, you spread the divine fragrance of Bhagwan, And as you do that, people will automatically change. It is not for you to change anybody. The change factor will be brought about by Bhagwan, But you have to learn how to spread his fragrance everywhere by your good deeds. And when you do that, your purpose is served. Beautiful, sir. It's a very nice explanation. And uh, the next question is, what is Swami's advice about how to forgive the ones who do bad things to you? The most difficult task for all of us. There are so many people who hurt us, who harm us. You know, they harm us sometimes in different ways. They sometimes, you know, how do you harm people? You can harm people in three ways only. One is physically. Hmm? Second is the worst harm through your words. Oh my God. Physical hurt can be overcome. But through words, when you tell a person that you are such an income poop, you are an absolute idiot, you have no understanding, you tell them bad words. That man will remember for his life. And the third thing, Swami says, you create violences by your thoughts. So the first process is change your thoughts, change your words. Automatically, actions would change. But then Swami gives a very beautiful example. Swami says, there is a person who hates you and you hate him back. You dislike him. All right. But then he's also a Swami's devotee. You are also a Swami's devotee. Now you have to cross his house every day. And outside his house, there is a picture of Bhagwan in a Abhay Hastap Mudra. So when you cross that house, what do you do? Do you not look at that side and say, eh, that is my enemy's house. I'm not going to look at his house. And that picture of Bhagwan, I'm not going to bow down at that picture. Why? Because it is in my enemy's house and he doesn't like me. I don't like him. No. In spite of that enemy being there, in spite of that enmity being between the two of you, the moment you see Swami's picture, you bow down to that picture. And you say in your prayer, Swami, give some sadbuddhi to that fellow and to me also, if you are sensible enough. Uh, so then you pray to Swami and you go. Swami says, when you are bowing to Swami's picture, in spite of that enemy's house, imagine that that Atma which is there in him is of Swami only. It is that house which is having the enmity. So how can you dislike the house? How can you dislike that person? Try to see that divinity. Try to see that Swami in him. Learn to forgive and forget. And the moment you forgive and you forget, you know, it is like letting the monkey go. Letting the banana go. Swami gives a beautiful story. He says, those people who want to catch hold of a monkey, it's so difficult to catch hold of a monkey because it is always jumping from one tree to the other. So what do they do? They put up some bananas in a jar. And the jar has a very narrow opening. The moment the monkey puts his hand inside, now he wants to take the banana out, but he can't let go of that hand. The moment he lets go of the banana, his hand will come out. But then he wants the banana also, and he is catching that banana in his hand. So his hand can't come out. So he's come, and the man who wants to catch hold of the monkey catches him and takes him now. Swami said, similarly, all of you hold this banana in your hand for the rest of your life also. That what is that banana? That banana was not liking that person. That person told me so and so. He spoke harshly to me. He gave me financial loss. This man cheated me. So that you are the monkey who is holding that banana. The moment you forgive that person, you forget that person, you let go of that banana. 
and the moment you let go of that banana your heart is bereft of that detachment uh, that attachment of that banana and the moment you let go of that fruit you are a free person but the moment you are catching yourself that oh he told me this he told me that he did this he did that you are a prisoner of your own thoughts so change your thoughts leave the banana go free and be free like that so if you keep on holding grudges you will always be a prisoner of your own thoughts yeah very nicely said sir about uh, forgetting and forgiving a bad person doing bad things to you by an example of banana the next question is for that incident of swami saying not to ask anything worldly one viewer has asked the following but i had prayed swami to convert my family members also and come into sai family for many years is that prayer is right see swami says each person is operating in his time zone see i was lucky that when i was 12 years old i came into swami's fold i came into swami's organization and now i am going to be 60 i am still continuing to be in swami's fold but then there are people who come into swami's fold when they are 50 and yet they may have moved in their sadhana much ahead so there is no time zone for anyone to come and go you cannot judge anybody's devotion or his commitment because that is for swami to do but when it comes to praying to swami you are right in praying to swami that swami let my family members and others also be devoted but instead of saying that you just say that swami i want you and you alone and when you say that swami i want you and you alone there is a provision in that ha huh? and then say swami i want you and you alone because i know that when i have you i have everything in this world so with that prayer swami knows what you want hmm swami will know that see swami gives a beautiful example of a worldly mother <clears throat> there is a man who's newly married and they are blessed with a small little baby child now one day when he comes back from his office so his wife opens up the door when he rings the bell and he hears the baby cry in the bedroom so the man says his wife oh i'm sure the baby is feeling hungry go and feed her so that you know she stops crying so then the mother very confidently without even looking at the bedroom says no no the baby must have done susu it must have wetted its nappy so i'll go and change the nappy and it will stop crying so after 5 minutes when she goes inside the man sees actually whether the baby is hungry or it is it needs the nappy needs to be changed he sees that the baby's nappy is wet the moment mother takes off a fresh nappy a dry nappy and she changes the nappy the baby stops crying now after two days again when the husband comes back again he hears the baby cry now he goes again and tells his wife oh the baby must have uh, must be needing a change in nappy why don't you go and change the nappy so the mother confidently says no no the baby is hungry i'll go and feed the baby and she'll feel okay the moment she goes inside the bedroom he also follows and he sure enough he sees the moment mother starts feeding the baby the baby stops crying so swami says when this worldly mother knows what you need without speaking you cry what is crying crying is praying so you only pray the child is not saying that mama come and change my nappy the child is not saying mama i am hungry so swami says when this worldly mother knows without the baby saying what the baby needs don't you think this divine mother knows what is the necessity of the child trust this divine mother just pray to her just pray to the divine mother and she will give you everything in this world have this faith and when you have this faith god says there is no choice but to give myself to you in totality in completeness in fullness wonderful sairam wonderful another two questions are there so uh, one is uh, swami had envision online training classes a decade ago and introduced the project sri satyasai vidya vahini could you kindly share what was swami's words as the vision and mission of vidya vahini see the mission why it was started was sri satyasai vidya vahini because we were all lucky as students to have studied in swami's college to be in his vicinity to have learned to have heard swami's divine words and gain wisdom gain insights 
purify our lives. So we thought that through technology, if we are able to transfer these words of Bhagwan, these teachings of Bhagwan through Sri Satya Sai Vidya Vahini, so a program was drafted by the schools wherein certain value inputs were incorporated in the classroom sessions. If a teacher is teaching English or Tamil or Telugu or Hindi, so how to teach values? Because, you know, like we said in Balvikas, what is the most important source? It is the teacher who teaches the children. Similarly, in a class, when a teacher is telling you something about mathematics, something about English, something about Tamil, but if she teaches you a small little story which has got a value base in it, so automatically the student learns the value also and learns the lesson also. So that way, both of them benefit more so the student because normally give them an example of doing this or doing that. But if you give a story which has got some value in it, so the child learns better. So the teaching of values through online courses and through these systems was what, what was initially imagined and probably initiated through the Sri Sakti Sai Vidya Vahini. Oh, thank you, Sairam. The imparting uh, value-based knowledge through online classes is the motto of uh, Vidya Vahini, if I say so. So last question, how to actively involve our ex Balvikas children in Swami's fold? Any message on this, Sairam? See, the Balvikas children understand they come to you in a very impressionable age. So you give them what, what is the work which I told Swami has given us to put a seed of love in their hearts and let the water of time pour on it so that they become a vatavriksha. What happens is when these children are there, we must create a system wherein even when they pass out of Balvikas, we have either their telephone number or their addresses and we invite them for some bhajan sessions or some seva sessions so that we are in touch with them. At least the teacher is in touch with them. When that is created, some kind of a touch. I know of certain Balvikas teachers. Uh, I know of Sister Kamala Pandya who's been running this Balvikas classes in Mumbai for last 25-30 years. And she has such beautiful stories to relate about those children that even when they grow up, when they get married, when they have a problem, they come back to the Balvikas teacher. Because they look at them as a Guru Ma who comes and trains them and so they have full faith. So it is the lesson which a Balvikas teacher is able to impart and the confidence which the Balvikas teacher is able to give in the child which will draw the child back to you. And when the child comes back to you, you initiate them into Namasvarna also, into Seva, into Narayan Seva, into all other activities. Our idea is ultimately not to make them members of the organization. Our idea is to spread goodness by creating good human beings. Don't think that we have only good people in Satyasai organization only. There are good people throughout the world. All these Bal Vikas children who are going into the world, they are the torch bearers of Sai's activity because you have poured that love of Swami into their hearts. And even now, when I come across so many Bal Vikas students, they still tell that, sir, we still remember that you must try to listen to the voice of conscience. Even now, when we try to do something wrong, that small little faint voice of conscience comes to us and tells us, don't do it. And we are able to still win over that uh, problem when we come across it. So similarly, we should ensure that we do our job, pray to Swami and leave the rest to him. Because ultimately, it is his unseen hand which will do. We have to do our job and forget it because he will do the rest. But do our job sincerely, honestly and with all our efforts. Create that love. And when that love is created, the child will come to you again and again. And when the child comes, the bond is there and you must give the child time and again the same love which your mother is giving you. Jai Sai Ram. Jai Sai Ram sir. Thank you very much. We have uh, two, uh, two to three questions considering the time. We will write the questions to you and request you to reply for the same. Sure. Okay, sure. sir. So, sir, during your journey with Sai, the program, it's uh, really wonderful and you have uh, covered many of your uh, memorable memories with Swami and particularly the language with Italian. Where, uh, what Swami said was, outside I show, I don't know anything. And inside, I know everything. 
that's a very good message and similarly uh, american boy translating telugu on swami's divinity it's wonderful experience so on behalf of sri satyasai organization tamil nadu chennai metro bus we thank you for your valuable time and sparing your uh, 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 wonderful experiences and uh, make this satsang a wonderful one a memorable evening thank you very much sir thank you once again so, we will now uh, uh, yeah we will now samastha loka sigino bhavantu uh, yeah समस्त सुखिनो बवंतु समस्त सुखिनो बवंतु समस्त सुखिनो बवंतु ओ शांति 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 जय बोलो भगवान श्री सत्य साई बाबा जी की जय